Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, so, okay, our next talk is by Mac Macler from CBPF. And he's going to talk about um, direct detection of dark matter, in particular about um, this new kind of detectors based on kinetic inductance. Please. Thank you. Um, so, good morning, and um, okay. So this is the, the um, this is a mix of uh, experimental and you understand what I mean, but the, <laughs> the experimental work is mostly carried out by Israel Hernandez, and this is a collaboration with uh, Juan Estrada at Fermilab and Clasio. Uh, who's uh, at, C at CFETCH here now. Uh, okay, so this is the plan of the talk. I'll, I'll first introduce what the MKIT detectors are, and then I'll provide a rather lengthy uh, motivation for uh, using them for dark matter research. And then I'll, I'll go to uh, issues that, uh, that these detectors have for optical uh, applications and uh, the experiments we did uh, producing, simulating, designing, producing, and, and, and simulating these, um, these detectors and the results we got. So we usually like to put things in context, and uh, I'm, I'm putting things in the larger context now. Uh, we like to, to quote uh, results from nature and science, big impact papers. I don't know if you are aware, most of you are, but we are uh, going through a very, very hard situation for science in Brazil, and this is just to, to put this context, so it's, it's really nice to have a meeting like that in a city like, like Natal and in a great institute like this. So it's really fantastic. Uh, but it will be hard to do this in the future if the situation continues like that. So just, just a warning. <laughs> okay, so now we can go to our sensors. Um, so why superconducting sensors? Um, superconducting sensors are very sensitive because the energy gap is very small. So if we compare, for example, with CCD detectors, which have uh, like a electron volt uh, uh, gaps, so we, we, ha we, ha we can detect the uh, energies uh, of electron volts. In the superconductors, the energy gap, which is the energy you need basically to break copper pairs, is given by, by this. So if you think that uh, you, ha you have a temperature of, let's say, 5 Kelvin, uh, it means that this thing will be, you know, uh, this is 10 to the minus 4 electron volts. So this will be like milli electron volts. So that's, that's uh, why these detectors are very sensitive. Uh, and a number of, of uh, superconducting detectors have been used for research in dark matter, like uh, superconducting tunnel junctions and mainly transition edge sensors, uh, you know, and, uh, both in the cosmological applications, like in telescopes, especially in, uh, in uh, CMB telescopes that look at microwaves, like the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, the South Pole Telescope, but also in direct detection experiments like CDMS, threats, and so on. So Okay, superconducting detectors are used, uh, but why we need to consider other detectors? So they are very sensitive, and also they have a, a, almost a negligible background. When we compare, again, with CCDs, uh, which have dark current, we have noise, basically you, 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 ha you are background free in terms of, uh, of the detector. However, if you want to, to put a large array of those detectors, that's, that's very hard. Uh, uh, you need to read each uh, sensor uh, separately. There's a lot of electronics. Also, you need to put cold electronics. So not only your sensor is at superconducting temperatures, but also your electronics is. You have to use a squid to, to read these things. So these are very expensive, very complicated, and very hard to multiply. So the microwave kinetic inductance detectors are also uh, superconducting detectors, but they rely on this kind of circuit. So it's a capacitor and an inductor. So this, this circuit has a resonance, has a resonance frequency, and what happens is when a photon hits the, the inductor, it will change the inductance and it will change the, 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 the resonance frequency. So if you see like a transmission curve like that, where you have a very clear uh, resonance with a frequency, once you, 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 you receive a photon, you have a shift in the frequency, you also have a shift in the phase of the signal that you can measure. So in principle, you are sensitive, to detecting single uh, uh, photons, uh, which break these Cooper pairs and change the kinetic inductance. Uh, to read these, we have to couple them to a transmission line, so we feed some signal, and then we measure the signal, and if there is a resonance, you'll see the absorption of this signal, right? Um, so again, uh, the, 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 f the phase shift is proportional to the energy of the, of the photon. So in principle, not only you measure individual photons, but you, measure, you have a, a, a measurement of the energy, too. And typically, they, they operate at, at the temperature, which is 
like a tenth of the critical temperature, right? So if if your superconducting is four, uh, is superconductor at four Kelvin, then you operate at 400 millikelvin. But uh, actually, it's not that simple. You have just a photon hitting the uh, 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 a photon breaking the copper pair. So it's not the way it works. Actually, you have a photon. It would generate a cascade in the the in the material. Uh, which has a, a down conversion of energy, it will first uh, ionize and then it will produce phonons. And actually those pho phonons are those that, that, uh, that break the copper pair. So it's not that direct and that will have a relevance that you'll see towards the end. Okay? Um, so again, these, these detectors, the sensors themselves are uh, at superconducting temperatures, but the electronics, it's outside. You just need to have a microwave line carrying the, the signal to outside. So you work at room temperatures, mostly like commercial uh, electronics. And you can put many, a uh, couple, many of these resonators to the same uh, feed line. Uh, each one, if they have a different frequencies, so you, you have uh, the, the typical resonance frequencies in the, the signal that is transmitted. And if, if one photon hits one of these sensors, you see a shift in the frequency there. So you can easily multiplex these, these, these sensors just reading many of them in a single feed line, uh, just tuning different frequencies. So uh, uh, in a range of microwave frequency, typically, in principle, you would be able to feed, to feed like uh, about thousands of these uh, resonators, okay? All right. Um, so not only we can co count single photons, also determine the energy, but these also have a very rapid response. So it's on the order of microseconds. So uh, uh, these are very rapid detectors, and this has many applications in astronomy due to this. Uh, as, as we said before, uh, you have uh, photons hitting the, the breaking copper pairs, actually all this down conversion of energy. But anyway, the photon is the source of the energy breaking the copper pairs. But also you may have phonons coming from some, some solid, and they will, will also break the copper pairs. So you'll see already that you can think of MKIDs as uh, sensors for astronomy where you expose them to light and, and, and you detect photons, or you couple these two, or you, you print this, these are actually 2D circuits, so you print this circuit on the top of a, of a crystal and you can measure the phonons, for example, produced by dark matter on that crystal. So one application that has been uh, uh, used is really like uh, produce a focal plane, like a, a camera for a, a telescope from optical, uh, from infrared to UV. Uh, also, for they are being considered for direct dark matter detection. Um, there are also other applications like neutrino detections, quantum computing, or qubits, uh, cosmic microwave background. They, they're actually being used for the next generation of SPT, uh, and also some millimeter astronomy. They are again uh, working instruments. But we will focus here on these two applications that connect to this meeting. They connect to dark matter, uh, both direct detection and uh, astronomical side. So on the direct detection side. Uh, as we mentioned, the, uh, superconducting, detector, superconducting detectors are used in, in direct detections, uh, but the advantage of using MKIDs is that you can, by, through this multiplexing, you can increase the, the area and also decrease the number of pixels. And let's say in a, in a CDMS detector, you could uh, uh, cover uh, uh, more densely with those sensors uh, and, and then have more precision in the position. Uh, also, uh, because of the timing that the phonon propagates, if they are surface events or events in the bulk, you are able to separate those two events. So that, that's something that would, be, uh, that would be very useful. And uh, it's been considered for the next generation of uh, CDMS-like uh, experiments. So this is, this is the example. Uh, you can also you could print uh, uh, these MKIDs on both sides of the, of the silicon crystal. Uh, and all, all these colorful things are different uh, resonators. So you have this uh, uh, position, position, and you have the timing uh, of arrival of the phonons in the different sensors. Um, so there is already a prototype uh, using these types of sensors. Uh, and, well, it's very preliminary. Uh, but you, you see this, this curve uh, again. This is just a calibration of the, of the critical temp temperature. Uh, going to another kind of uh, dark matter candidate now, dark photons. There has been a proposal to use also MKIDs to detect dark photons uh, by having an, uh, strips with some kind of absorbed uh, material like alum aluminum. And uh, uh, again, this, 
uh, uh, dark photon will produce phonons. They are detected by the by the M kids, and this is like a forecast of uh, of uh, of uh, phonons on s on uh, uh, these stripe strip kind of detectors. So these are the forecasted limits. If you have just one, or if you have a, a lot of these strips uh, with different assumptions on the background, um, here in uh, in uh, what's this orange? In orange are the limits from the stars. I know Andreas mentioned that uh, that maybe uh, uh, dark photons are not a good explanation for the stars, but anyway, they are just quoting the, these limits from uh, stars. Then you have uh, from um, from other experiments. So that would probe. Uh, some part of the unexplored uh, uh, parameter space of dark photons. Um, okay, so this is this was uh, um, dark matter direct detection unrelated to my, my work. I just wanted to put here as a motivation. I'm more looking towards the the optical uses of these sensors. So these are, as we mentioned, photon counting devices uh, which have an uh, energy resolution and which have a uh, timing uh, measurement. Um, also, s because of these small energy gaps, they are able to cover a mo much more broad uh, energy range, a wavelength range, than the standard CCD. CCDs are standard detectors for astronomy, uh, but they are usually limited to near infrared, if you have thick ones, to, to visible. And with MKIDS, you could go down from, uh, from near infrared to, to what, what, n for m not so near infrared, uh, larger wavelengths than CCDs to ultraviolet. So also, uh, you have a more a, a wider frequency domain. And again, they can be highly multiplexed, which means you can build a camera with pixels. Uh, but each of these pixels, we ha would have a measurement, a, a rough measurement of the energy of uh, the photon. So it's like an integral field spectrograph. It's a, you have a, a low resolution spectra for each of the pixels of this, of this, uh, of this image that you would get. Um, in cosmology, we are very interested in measuring some very basic thing feature of the spectrum, which are is the redshift. We just want to measure a shift on the spectrum. And usually, when we want to cover very wide fields, we use this technique named photometric redshift, by which instead of taking uh, a spectrum of each galaxy, which is very costly, uh, you just get images in different bands, and you uh, compute a redshift using this information, very broad information on different sets of wavelengths. Here, first, you would have a higher resolution than the photometric redshifts because you have a, a better energy resolution than just putting broadband filters. But also, by covering this wider wavelength, we would avoid one of the problems of photometric redshift, which are those catastrophic features. So they would be, uh, uh, in principle, promising for cosmological applications. There are several studies in the literature uh, addressing that, well, a few addressing that. Uh, also, the fact that we are getting the photons in real time means that we, 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 we could be able to make a post-processing of the data and just, uh, uh, if you have a, a photon coming from a star and it's hitting different parts of the detector just because of the point spread function because of the atmosphere, you could do a post-processing and correct this. So you could have a much higher resolution that was normally uh, allowed by our atmosphere, something akin to uh, optic, uh, adaptive optics. So there, there's a like, state-of-the-art uh, 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 summary of uh, the situation on MKIDS for optical astronomy, for optical astronomy is given in this, uh, in this paper for the, uh, the white paper for Astro 2020. Um, so there are many, many potential applications even on the high resolution uh, spectroscopy and there are a few operating devices which, uh, uh, which are prototypes and have been used in, in some telescope like in Palomar telescope. Okay, so where, where the dark matter fits in all this? Let's uh, make the, the connection. So uh, what are the kinds of probes in cosmology that we can really sense uh, properties of dark matter? Uh, usually we think about the small scale problems in cosmology, like the cusp profiles, overabundance of satellites, uh, too big to fail. All these features are maybe problems with the WIMP, whatever WIMPs are, even like axions, cold dark matter. So they, they hint at the possible problem with the cold dark matter paradigm. Uh, so that's where you could uh, uh, find some constraints on the dark matter properties, like if it's uh, warm and not cold and so on. Uh, so some like standard probes of these small scale problems, uh, uh, the current probes are the Lyman Alpha Forest, where you can, can study the, 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 the distribution of matter uh, in cosmological distances, but in small scales. 
uh, but then you really need a fine uh, a measurement of the redshift because you really want to measure the structure in the radial direction. And, and this broad uh, energy measurement by MKIDS is not enough. Uh, also, dwarf galaxies are a typical place uh, to, put, uh, to study properties of dark matter, but you need to have you know, wide fields to find them. If you want to measure the dynamics, uh, again, you need uh, detailed spectroscopy. Another example is strong lensing, where you have, a, 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 I'll, I'll show you more details, but you have a galaxy or galaxy cluster lensing some foreground galaxies, and then you want to see, uh, uh, you want to recover the mass distribution from the, from the images you have, and there you need the high spatial resolution. You just need the radio information to set up the global scale. So that's where having uh, a low resolution redshift may be very useful and enough. So we'll focus here on the strong lensing side. Uh, so uh, to my understanding, it's the only application uh, where we can measure small scale uh, uh, properties, but still have not so good uh, spectroscopic resolution. So I'll start by showing you the, the is this? Correct? No. Okay, cool. <laughs> Good. <laughs> then how much time I have? Fifteen. Okay, that's, that's too bad anyway. Okay, so I'll skim more quickly through this, but the idea is to, 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 to show a bit the power of the strong lensing, uh, uh, re uh, the strong lensing reconstruction uh, and show an issue with redshift to motivate uh, why we are going to study these uh, sensors in more detail. Uh, so I have to, to rush a little bit, but just to remind you that we will be talking about lensing. Lensing is the deflection of light by gravity, which, by the way, was measured for the first time 100 years ago here in Brazil, not so, long, not so far from Natal in the Sobral in Ceará. So the, ang the deflection angle was measured, and it's actually twice the Newtonian expectation. So that's a result we use. Uh, and the actually, the, the, the lensing is just a mapping of uh, what you would see in an image without the lens in between. And what you actually see of the trajectory is a deformed background uh, because of the mass distribution. So the mapping to these two planes, the, the, the let's say no lens plane to the observ to, to the, the no lens plane to the observed plane is given by some function which depends on the matter. So typically it's an integration on the line of sight of the matter, like the, the, the lens in uh, the matter in the lens, and some combination of cosmological distances. Okay, so strong lensing in particular is an effect where you have uh, very strong distortions of the source, sometimes multiple images, large magnifications, and also time delays. If the source is varying, you'll see it at different times here. So all these phenomena have been uh, observed and are, and are used uh, uh, every day in, in, in cosmology and astrophysics. Uh, but the point here is to use this to understand, to connect with, with, uh, with dark matter. So, well, from the large-scale geometry of the problem, you can already measure omega m, so the, the fraction of the total matter in, uh, in dark matter. I'll show a measurement, but that's not what we're really more interested in. We really would like to understand, uh, to look at the details of the mass distribution, and from there, uh, try to, 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 uh, to limit properties on the dark matter interactions. Um, also, due to this amplification by the, the lensing effect, we are able to detect galaxies that have very high redshift, so we are ab able to measure, for example, the abundance of ultraluminous, uh, uh, ultraviolet galaxies, which are very sensitive to the initial power, sp uh, to the initial power spectrum, so to the if matter is warm or not. So not only we, we can recover the large scale geometry, also the detail uh, uh, mass distribution, but also use the magnification to probe the more uh, more early universe. And and what we really uh, looking for is deviations from cold dark matter, which might be explained either by warm dark matter, self-interacting dark matter, fuzzy dark matter, or something that has a property different from CDM. So for this kind of studies, what we need is um, high resolution uh, s uh, uh, imaging, like usually from Hubble Space Telescope, uh, deep also, and uh, spectroscopy. Uh, if we have an integral field unit, like an instrument named MUSE, which is in a very large telescope, eight meters, and it has a, all, every pixel is a, is a spectrometer. That's the typical thing you would use. But there's a super oversubscribed instrument, very hard to get time. So could we use things like MKITS? That's the question. Um, so, uh, okay, let's, let's, let's go <laughs> fast. 
But we, we see multiple images, and we use this position of multiple images to recover what is the mass distribution. So we have a mass distribution model, and we want these multiple images to map to the same source. And this we are able to do to, to a large uh, a, a degree of detail um, if we have a large number of sources. I will show an example. Also, there is this cosmological dependence, uh, where I, I've shown before the cosmological distance. They depend on the cosmological model. So you have both this dependence on lo local mass distribution and the overall uh, uh, geometry. And if you have a cluster like that, where you have uh, 102 multiple images, and you have this integral field unit information, uh, so you have a redshift for every single galaxy of the lens, and I mean the galaxy cluster that's lensing, and of the lensed galaxies, then you can look at a lot of the details and make a detailed modeling uh, uh, to recover both the large-scale structure, the large-scale geometry of the universe, and the mass distribution. So this is an example uh, of a few years ago. Uh, they used uh, 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 actually 10 families of spectroscopic redshift. So these are 10 sources which have multiple uh, images. There are 30 multiple images there. And you're able to place some constraints. I'll show some updated results that we obtained. Doubled the number, thanks to this integral field unit data, we doubled the number of families with multiple images. So we have 20 uh, 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 families uh, which, which measure redshift and which give about 40, uh, about 80 multiple images. And we use this to measure in the space of the dark matter density and the dark energy equation of state. We use this to measure uh, uh, the, the probability uh, distribution. So these are the confidence contours in, in, in black for one, two, and three sigma uh, from the strong lensing. So using a single strong lensing galaxy. And we compare this to standard cosmological probes like supernovae, biracoustic oscillations, and, and, uh, and CMB, Planck. And of we see this uh, striking agreement between all the probes, which is sort of known. Uh, but you, you see a striking agreement with the strong lensing. Although they are larger uh, error bars, you see we are talking about a single system. Uh, these are like uh, 3,000 supernova, sky survey, uh, CMB, uh, millions of galaxies. And we are looking at a single, single system. And with this detailed, uh, detailed modeling, we're able to get meaningful cosmological constraints. I find this very surprising. And if we compare to each of the probes, strong lensing can add something. But the point is that it's a consistency test. So we are able to recover both the mass distribution and the large-scale uh, uh, large uh, geometry of the universe in agreement with other probes. And this is not the only example. Of course, the more striking, I won't have time to show, is a, a supernovae on, on the galaxy and, and galaxy clusters where you can, you can predict where a, a second image of the supernova will appear with a magnification and so on, and you can cross-validate. So uh, there is confidence that we can model uh, these systems to a certain degree. One thing we wanted to test is whether we can do this with photometric redshifts. And basically, uh, our uh, uh, result is that we cannot do uh, this kind of analysis reliably with photometric redshifts of the quality that we have today. Uh, but if we had uh, like some spectroscopy with a low resolution like MKIDS, probably we would be able to provide uh, very uh, uh, good constraints without the need of spectroscopy. So we did some simulation uh, with different kind of resolutions. I I'll show how this resolution maps to the, to the M kids. Uh, but so the 30, 40 are, are a very large number of filters. 100 is sort of the limit of resolution that we, you would be able to obtain in principle with M kids. Uh, and so we simulate how we can recover these redshifts and uh, our precision is uh, 0.01, which is quite good. This is about a factor of 10 better than the photometric redshift we used in the previous slide. So really, we, are, we, we would be able to improve a lot. This is just a simulation of the quality of the redshift that we would get by using uh, MKIDS with the expected theoretical energy resolution. Okay? So this is for our fault. OK, so uh, actually a lot of effort is being put not to measure the global geometry, but really, really look at substructures. Uh, substructures are very sensitive to some models of dark matter. So you use this large distribution of galaxies, uh, of, of, of multiple image galaxies, to recover the mass distribution. And there have been a lot of discussions in the, li in the literature uh, for scales that are above 10 kiloparsec. Basically, everyone agrees. But the scale that's interesting to probe, let's say, the most uh, uh, favored 
uh, a stereo neutrino model, 7 keV, uh, 3 point, uh, yeah, 7 keV, uh, it's just below that. And, and there you have a lot of discussion in the literature. Some people see uh, deviations from cold dark matter and some don't. Again, I, I will not go into the detail. But if you go to smaller scale systems like Einstein rings, these are a single galaxy imaging a distant galaxy. Uh, you, are sen you're, you can decrease uh, uh, the, the your sensitive to the mass. For example, you are able to detect a substructure of 10 to the 8 solar masses. Galaxies typically 10 to the 11 solar mass. So it's a, a perturbation along the line of sight. You are able to measure these uh, uh, substructures. And if you have like 100 of these systems of these Einstein rings with very high resolution, you'll be able to, to, to place constraints on this kind of, of uh, size of uh, substructure, which would constrain a lot, uh, either rule out or prove the 7 kV stereoneutrino. Okay? Uh, another uh, interesting setting is where you have, you, you, you heard probably about the bullet clusters, uh, where you have the dark matter, the, the gas, and the galaxies, and they, they mix up. You see a shift between the galaxies and the gas. Uh, but if the dark matter is self-interacting, you also see a shift between the dark matter and the galaxies. And people are looking into that. How can I separate galaxies with da from dark matter by, by the lensing? So comparing the centers of light with the center of the lensing, you can try to measure those shifts and put constraints on the self-interaction cross-section. Uh, again, and to the scale where this becomes relevant is a bit controversial. Some people place lower limits, some people place upper limits. But it's something on the verge of getting very reliable results. Uh, and uh, finally, through this abundance of uh, high redshift galaxies. You can also place constraints, for example, on the mass of, uh, of a stereo neutrino, and these are some results more or less recent. But this was really a motivation to use MKIT. Whoops. No, 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 no. Not, not so fast. So this was a motivation for using MKIDs. Why don't we just build a big MKIDs instrument? So there are, there are some problems. So the current optical at infrared M kits, they are producing by deposition of titanium nitrate on, on silicon, and they are produced by a process that calls sputtering. So basically, you kind of shine some, some uh, thin film on a, on, a, on a circuit, and then you remove the pieces you don't want. Um, the problem with, with this, and, and you won't see this in the papers usually, so if you want to know the problems, pay attention. This is not... <laughs> It is not in the literature very clear, but you have a frequency collision, so you have a problem that sometimes you have a mixing of the frequency. You cannot predict uh, each of your sensors which frequency you have, so you have to calibrate like an array and shine line to see this line corresponds to which frequency. You, you cannot predict. Uh, there is a change of frequency and quality factors each time you, 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 you take the system to, to room temperature, so it's not a very predictable si uh, system. Each time you have to calibrate it again and again. And also, you lose a lot of pixels, so about 30% of the pi your pixels are useless, okay? And you are very uh, far yet from the theoretical resolution that was assumed uh, for this uh, quantity. This is the delta lambda over lambda, or the, uh, E over delta E, lambda over delta lambda. So it's the variation on, on the energy that you, that you can, uh, your energy resolution. So uh, the theory was about 100, and you get values about 12, 6. Uh, so how, how did we approach uh, this problem? So I say, let's build uh, uh, MKIDs, but with a more, let's say, cleaner technique of atomic layer uh, deposition. So we will deposit uh, layer by layer, atom by atom, uh, which is cleaner than, than sputtering. And hopefully, we would be able to have uh, detectors that behave better. Um, we also uh, use simulations to have predictions for the quality factors, predictions for the for the resonant frequency and so on. And we really wanted to do you know, a prototype and make a systematic test of predictability, reproducibility, stability, and also the response to light to try to understand how we get these values there. So we, we, uh, actually, we, we didn't design. We got a design ready of MKIDs from the University of Chicago. We just printed those devices in, this, in the four uh, silicon wafers. Actually, I'll show the results on two of them. So this is the wafer, it shows really bad here. Uh, and these small squares are different uh, sets of MKIRs, MKIDs. So each square here is, is something like that. So we'll cut these and each piece becomes a, a, a detector with 12 sensors, okay? And we'll show the results for uh, sensors produced in two different wafers 
and uh, within the same wafer in two different positions, so four M kits. Uh, but first we do these simulations, which have a lot of assumptions, and then we get this pattern of the, 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 the resonances. So we, we, we know in principle uh, modulo uh, some unknown kinetic inductance that we don't know, but if, if we put some kinetic inductance, then we get these, um, uh, the frequency, uh, uh, the resonant frequency. So we went to a fabrication facility at the University of Chicago. Uh, I'm putting a picture of myself, but basically uh, they did, uh, uh, I was just an ex-spectator there. Um, so this, after, after they are produced, it's a lengthy process, but I will skip this. Uh, once they are produced, they are, uh, uh, they are put in, a, in, a, in this box, which is a gold-plated box, and this thing goes to a code probe uh, that will, 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 will work with the superconducting temperatures. So this is put here. This is a, uh, an ADR. So this is it's cool to uh, about uh, 200 millikelvin. Actually, we tune the temperature. I will show that. Uh, but only the this detector is cold. All the electronics is outside. So these are the transmission curves. Um, so if you see this wiggly thing, this is the uh, actually the transmission line. It's not the resonances. It's some. It's bad. I mean. Uh, uh, it's not an, a nice transmission line should be you know straight but okay and the spikes that you see here are the resonant frequencies we have 12 resonators you can count usually 12 of these resonating frequencies but you already see that they are in different positions right so these are four wafers the, the shift in the y direction is artificial but you see that they are totally in different positions so you see by eye that this predict predictability thing didn't work very well we we did exactly the same recipe uh, and we don't get exactly the same frequency, uh, um, ex uh, resonance frequencies. Yes, five minutes, okay, thanks. Um, so this is a typical transmission curve, and we have a model for this that we fit, and from this fit we get the resonance frequency, and we have also the quality factors, uh, which in principle we, we can tune when we design this thing. So this is a transmission line with with the M kids, and they are coupled uh, uh, ca uh, capacitively. And by tuning the distance, we can tune the quality factor. So in principle, we can uh, we, we could choose these quality factors, but we measure them from the data, the quality factors, and the resonance the resonance frequencies. And um, you know, I mentioned that a shift in the in the frequency occurs when you receive a photon, right? But also, if you change the temperature of your sensor, uh, this frequency also shifts. And this frequency shift is connected to the shift in the imaginary part of the current, which by a given model uh, is given by this. So, so this, this well-known mattis berding theory in superconductivity. So uh, here there is a dependence on delta, which you, you remember is 2 point something times Boltzmann constant times the critical temperature. So basically this is the temperature that you choose your sensor to be. You regulate this temperature and you want to measure delta, okay? So by this, by, by putting your detector in different temperatures, you measure different values uh, of this quantity, and by fitting this, you measure the critical temperature of your sensor. So you do this on a, on a, on a resonator by resonator basis, and you can measure critical temperature for each resonator for each M kit. And so this is the curve of this delta F over F. Um, there is data, there is a fit. Actually, the fit is not perfect, this mattis berdin uh, theories for one kind of uh, superconductor. Uh, this is titanium nitrate, this disorder superconductor. But that, that doesn't matter really. What matters is that this thing, regardless of the specific expression, is a function of T alone. If this is a function of T alone, uh, even if the T critical I, I measure is not exactly the, the critical temperature, it will, be able, it, it will enable us to compare the critical temperature of different, uh, of different resonators. So the only assumption is a function of T. Okay, and so this is the result. So this is the, the critical temperatures, and, and each of these uh, color codes is a different M kids. Within M kids, uh, we are, we are uh, counting the number of resonators that have a given temperature. So this is the distribution of temperatures within each M kid. So you see here, it's two M kids, and, and things are really uh, uh, superimposed. So these are two M kids from the same wafer, and these are two M kids from a, a different wafer. So within the wafer. They are very stable. I mean, it's a 1% variation on temperature, wh whereas with when you run with sputtering, it's like a 10 or 20% variation. So we are really 
uh, that's what we expect because the, the critical temperature is the is the w uh, is the w um, the how you say the, not the width well anyway is the size of the of the number of, uh, of, of of the superconducting film and this we tune exactly with uh, with the atomic layer deposition so that's what we expected and we if you compare different wafers like two percent so that's very nice we are in that sense we are very homogeneous as compared to sputtering and now when you look at the, the difference in frequencies. It's just it's a, it's a one percent variation. So we compare the frequency of each resonator with one resonator in a given reference. So we have one MKids, and we compare the frequencies of the other four, uh, other three MKids, resonator by resonator. We compare the differences in the resonances. So we have differences that go to eight percent to one percent, and that sounds small, but actually it's large because it's larger than the than 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 uh, than we would like. Our uh, resonators are, are separate, but we would like to populate them a lot to put, let's say, 1,000 ones, and that would mix them completely, so that's bad. And if you see at the loaded quality factors, we are comparing the difference between the expectation computed with the simulation with the actual uh, uh, number measured, and we, com you, we are using log, just to tell you, I mean, the very large differences. Um, so there are significant frequency variations, large variations in the quality factor, and we try to reproduce them saying, well, maybe we, we, we messed something up, uh, the sizes uh, change it because of some reason, uh, different temperatures and, and the size of the sensor are different, or maybe the silicon gets some impurities, or maybe the etching, when we, we put us the, this titanium nitrate and we remove it. When we remove it, we remove a bit of silicon too. Maybe we had etched too much differently in different sensors. So we tried many things and we tried to simulate the effect of the different production uh, things on the, de the sensor, um, uh, nothing could explain uh, what was going on. Perhaps the problem with the, the transmission line, which is too wiggly, and this is affecting uh, uh, our measurements. It could be, but maybe it could be an intrinsic lim limitation on titanium nitrate and kids. Um, but anyway, so now we want to see the response to light. And what is important here is that uh, this resolution of the uh, of energy resolution, so your spectral resolution, uh, is proportional to this uh, thing here. Well, here's the frequency of the photon, you know, Planck's constant. This is the efficiency. This is a final factor. This is something that can be measured by other means, and it's about 0.2. And this is the, the, the delta, the gap. So really, what what's government was governing the resolution is the efficiency here. And this efficiency usually is assumed to be a value that's given on a very old paper and is a very different assumptions than, than the actual geometry of, of an actual MKID. So it's very strange, but most people just use this value. So we try to measure it. And so we wanted to shine light to the MKID through a window. Of course, this is complicated because you have to keep it cold, but people design that thing. Um, and so we, we, we put some light pulses that go into the, the, the sensors and we can control that. Usually, the single photon uh, 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 feature of MKIDs is measured with X-rays. But since we want to use them in the optical, we really have to calibrate this eta in the optical. So that's what we wanted to do, to shine you know, optical light into the MKIDs. And for that sake, we, we send bunches of photons. So we send pulses with some peri periodicity, and we want to measure the response of the MKID to these pulses. So this is for a high intensity signal that you clearly see. So you have a noise. So this is uh, electronic noise and so on. And these spikes are the, the phase shifts on each. This is one resonator. So these are the sh phase shifts uh, induced by the light. So you can make a statistics of this. But when the light is very, very uh, um, not strong, uh, this is buried in the signal. So we devised the way that we are able, even when you don't see clearly the, 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 the response to light, we devise, we devise a way where you can see this is just the noise and this is the statistical uh, peaks, even when they are small. So we can measure this thing. And from this, we can measure the efficiency. So if we compute of that Gaussian, the mean and the, the, the width, uh, the slope of this relation is, is, is the gain. And uh, once we know the gain and we know some geometrical properties, of our sensors, we can compute the efficiency. Now results, okay, this is preliminary work, okay? Uh, so uh, we, we didn't publish a paper yet, so I mean, don't use these numbers, but it's quite astonishing 
that uh, we, we got uh, a very, very low uh, uh, um, uh, efficiency. This is when we, we just shine the line to the whole MKID sensor, right? Uh, but typically in astronomical situation, you would like uh, the light to go to one of the sensors only. So you put a mask there. So we, we have a mask where you have holes only on the, in the inductory. So this would be more like an astronomical situation. And there we find uh, efficiencies that are like about 100, is 10 to 100 times less than the theoretical value. Okay? Yes. Time is over? Okay, that's, I think that's the last slide before conclusions. Um, so we find these really small efficiencies that could explain why the uh, resolution is uh, lower than what we usually uh, have. Question is, uh, what's going on? Uh, perhaps what's going on is you have this down conversion of energy, and the photon is just converting phonons that just go to the bulk of the silicon, and they don't stay in the titanium nitrate to, to break copper pairs. So that's one possible explanation. So some people are, are trying to design uh, uh, sensors where the titanium nitrate is hanging with no substrate so that the pho phonons need to propagate there and more efficiently uh, uh, break copper pair. Uh, but uh, recent theoretical calculations show that this efficiency is a function of the energy. Uh, and so for our very low energies, it could be well be that we our results match the simulations. The problem is that these simulations don't go to such a low energies as we do. Okay, so concluding remarks. Um, MKIDs are promising for dark matter detection in astrophysics. What I have shown you is not very promising, but it's just because it's titanium nitrate optical MKIDs. But MKIDs has been used, as I said, in submillimeter, in microwave, and, uh, and perhaps for dark matter detection. So these kinds of sensors still uh, uh, don't be fooled by some negative result. They are still promising for some applications. Perhaps the titanium nitrate, not. Um, what we did, uh, I think it's the first time that, that, we, that uh, someone uses simulations to try to predict what's going on. It's the first time that uh, uh, atomic data position fabrication is titanium nitrate sensors. And I think it's the first time that the deficiency is measured directly from the data. Um, so th they, they are indeed uh, more uniform, and we have shown that they are more stable when you cool down and reheat, even if you disassemble and put back the ship there. So they are more uh, stable, but however, they have very low uh, energy efficiency, uh, much worse energy resolution. So for the applications we are interested in, they are not that uh, uh, appealing. Um, but there are lots of future step, uh, steps. Uh, well, first we want to complete that. We are studying many uh, features. We want to complete this. Uh, but also new designs that, uh, that could improve the efficiency uh, of the of this titanium nitrate uh, sensors, or move to other materials. People have been using uh, platinum over silicon and other materials that could be better, or just shift to other wavelengths where we know them kids are good, like in microwave. Uh, and the question is, will they be used for dark matter detection? Okay, thanks. Okay, questions? Hi, uh, I was wondering, 